All right, everyone. Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it's great to be back here on Adobe Live for a two-day series today, uh, video editing with my good friend Vashi Nedomansky from Vashi Visuals. So we've got two days to cover all sorts of really amazing stuff in Premiere, in Audition, probably a bit of After Effects. Uh, so fortunate to have not only uh, um, one of the best people I know and someone who's just done everything in the industry, but someone who truly has an enormous amount of knowledge and context to bring to this. So you're not going to just see like standard editing stuff. We're going to go through all different types of projects and talk formats and really esoteric nerdy stuff, stuff that's really hard to get pretty much anywhere else. So uh, this is going to be super exciting. We're so glad to have Vashi. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things as always, uh, just real quickly for the schedule today. So only got a couple a uh, couple more hours with us live on Adobe Live today. So again, I'm with you uh, with Vashi from noon until 2 p.m. Pacific. Then at 2, we've got the XD Daily Creative Challenge with Andrea. And then at 2.30, rounding out the day, Design in the Dark with Andrew and Jennifer. So um, lots more to do. And then, of course, we've got a full schedule coming back tomorrow here on Adobe Live. So I'll tell you what, uh, as always, it's always great to see everybody. See, we've got really, wow thousands of people in the chat here. So we've got Rodrigo and Desiree and Eunice and Abdurrahman and uh, Hassan. All right. And David and Elias and Lulu and Bongi and Zia and uh, Drick and Dublagru and Arumia. Wow. Such a wonderfully international audience. Really lovely to see you all. Okay. So without further ado, he is a filmmaker. He is an editor, he is a producer, he has worked in Hollywood on incredible Hollywood films like Deadpool, Six Below, and many others. He is a sound editor. He's done basically everything. He's even had, <laughs> I was gonna say, had the pleasure of filming me once, but the pleasure was truly mine. Uh, it is my good friend and filmmaker, Vashi Nedimansky from Vashi Visuals. How's it going today, man? It's going great. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely. Coming That's in loud and clear. Wonderful. That's the first problem we always have. I'm like, oh my God, the technology, and you just want to make sure you're seen and heard and everyone can hear it. So that's awesome. So again, thank you so much for having me for, for two days of chaos. And um, I'm excited to uh, share some of my workflows and tips and tricks and things I've learned over 20 years of editing and professionally in Hollywood on, on lots of projects. So awesome. What do you think? Yeah. So, and I know, I mean, we're going to, I know we were going to try and sort of break this down. We've got a lot of different topics. So um, what are we looking at pro primarily for the first, the first couple of topics sure. today that we're going to be going over? So what I'm thinking is that um, with my you know experience over the 20 years, I've basically had to break down the post-production workflow from ingest to delivery. And that's, I've broken it down to 10 steps. So over the next two hours today and then two hours tomorrow, we're gonna to do like five chapters each day where I just touch upon what I've learned to be the best practices that work for me. Now they could not, maybe they don't work for everyone, but right. they'd have worked for me. And I've, you know, and like all the other filmmakers, we've gone through the trials and tribulations of making mistakes and that's where we learn the most. And that's Absolutely. when we try and nail down what we really like and what works for us and what's the best method to approach stuff. But also, as you know, every project's a different challenge. You have to be adept and pivot and make changes and deal with new codecs and deal with right. new everything. So game right. plan is to share over two hours today, the first half and then the second half. And once we get into my uh, timeline, I can I can break it down a little easier. But that's what okay. we're looking at, you know. Great. Broad strokes. All right. Well, perfect. Well, as always, we're coming to you live on Adobe Live, Behance, Facebook, Twitter, and Periscope. So again, thank you so much. And Vashi, of course, I'll be fielding you questions and I'll be answering things. I'm probably going to be primarily silent, uh, no, fielding a lot of questions in the chat. Well, all right, not, not primarily, but really yeah. this is for you to drive. So, um, but I'll be answering your questions in the chat and I can also field some up uh, to Vashi as, they, uh, as you bring them up. So again, 
wherever you are. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, Jason, uh, because we're covering so much, like, you know, all of post-production in four hours yeah. as, a, as a viewpoint, I think if people want to jump in, if something specific hits them, they're like, hey, you know, can you clarify something? I don't want to uh, leave anyone out. And this is based for beginners, professional, for everyone, because there is a structure to post-production. There's a structure to the creativity. And I want to share that. Awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, man, let's go ahead and kick into it. We've got your screen up here. So all right. quick introduction, just for anyone who doesn't know me, and I'm sure that's a lot of people. I'm Vajdan Amansky. I'm, a, I'm an, an ace editor, proud member of, the, of that group. And I've worked on films like Deadpool and, and I cut Sharknado 2. And today we're going to be talking about Six Below. And I just worked on, you know, I've cut 11 feature films and worked on dozens of TV shows and all that other kind of stuff. So that's basically who I am. And this is what I'm going to try to be teaching you with. And um, can Jason, you can see my screen. Is everything? Oh, yeah. OK, Looking good. Everything's coming through. OK, so just to as we get into it, here are the 10 chapters or, or sections that we're going to go over. And uh, I know we have a lot of time, but I don't want to rush. But I also don't want to miss anything. There's a lot to, a lot to go over. So everything from your hardware choices off out of the gate, the software choices, obviously Adobe for me for a long time, preferences, ingesting, basic film editing, advanced, audio editing, color correction, VFX and timeline, VFX and deliverables. Now, one thing that's really important is as an editor at, at any level these days in Hollywood or, or anywhere else, the more skills you have in your bag, the more the larger your tool bag, the more valuable you are. And every editor now is expected to be able to do an audio mix and pull a key using VFX and much, much more than just cutting picture and then handing it over to someone. Um, and I think all the viewers will recognize that producers and uh, directors sometimes, if they don't see the whole completed narrative of that piece, right. they can't fill in the blanks. And it's not their right. fault, but right. it's our job to deliver a, a very polished and professional cut of anything that you're doing on the first pass because there is no like second chance. Um, there is none of that stuff happening. So right. that's that's what I would say. I, I find it also interesting too that as you just pointed out, and again, for a lot of people who are kind of new in the industry, you're absolutely right, right? I mean, it's you're, it's just an expectation that, right, whether you're filming it or, you know, holding the boom mic, if you're the one in the post seat editing it together, you've got to deliver something that kind of seemingly appears kind of finished, even though it's very rough, whereas, the people reviewing it, they're kind of only expected to do their thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily go both ways. But that's that's the burden we have in production. And that's really what I think everyone's gonna be super excited to see you share today. So right. let's go ahead and get into it, man. Okay, so first chapter is hardware and software. And again, like some of this stuff's gonna be uh, kind of in the weeds out of the gate because it's like my analogy is if you're going to drive a car from L.A. to Detroit, the first thing you have to do is gas up the car, check the oil, check the, the tire pressure, you know, put windshield wiper fluid in, get some snacks. You can't just jump in a car and go. Your car has to be optimized and has to be the best car for that situation. Right. Same with with us. Like on Six Below, we had to um, – I'm just going to play this trailer in the, in the background while we're doing this. Yeah. Um, just to have a sense of the film that we're dealing with. So we, you can hear me, right, Jace? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, what we had to do was we were dealing with 6K footage, and this is the first Hollywood feature film where we had um, – oh, let me turn that down. Where we edited the native red files from the camera, and by doing this, we had to find the hardware solution, the software solution that could handle it because we didn't have time to do proxies or do transcodes. We had to jump right in and every day I would get four or five hours of raw footage. And that's when I started cutting at night and in the morning. And because we were filming up in the mountains, we didn't have any place to go in terms of, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no connection. Um, if the editor, sorry, if the directors had to grab more footage, then we had to literally tell them right away so they were still at the same spot. So again, right. if the technology and the hardware feeds into the workflow that you're dealing with, and that's different on, on every film. So that was our first challenge with Six Below, was to have what could handle 6K at this time, red raw files where we're editing right off that. Um, you know, you need a powerful computer. And right. so, you know. You still do. <laughs> you still do. <laughs> yeah, especially month. then, but even now, right. I mean, And yeah. even 4K, if you don't have some meat on your computer and your processor, then it's going to lag. It's going to be a really miserable experience when it comes to editing. Um, one thing that I've always 
tried to do as much is front load my hardware to the point like you know, as, as much as I can invest up front is going to give you better results downstream. If you try and cut corners, if you try and like use less RAM or this or that, it's really going to bite you in post because you're just going to be fighting the machine. You're going to be wasting time. You're going to be waiting on the machine. Um, and not everyone has the, the amount of money for a huge budget for your post-production gear, but you do have to set it aside and, and go for the video cards and the RAM. Like those two things, I think you'd agree, I hope you would agree, oh, yeah. are some of the most important dealing with all these codecs and stuff that we have today. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, but go ahead. You're going to say something. I was going to say, yeah. And the funny thing is, I mean, again, now, when did you cut this? And was this 2017? This 2017, yeah. 2017, 2018 yeah. that we cut it and then um, did post. It was like nine months of post. And I actually, um, you know, I use Premiere Pro. I've used it since 2006. So I've, I have a yep. long history with it and, and seen many, many iterations. And this is definitely the best iteration that's going right now. Right. Um, but um it was the only one that could handle this. We tested all the other NLEs out there to see if we could just handle the red raw, raw footage. And that's why I keep coming back to Adobe. They work with us and they they help make those improvements. Um, for example, when I worked on um, Gone Girl and Deadpool, we were getting requests from the editors and the editorial staff. And then Adobe was making those changes on the fly and giving us new builds while we were editing. Right. Um, which is amazing. I, I actually remember that. I remember that during the, the Deadpool days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Like, you know, on Deadpool, we had 550 hours of raw footage. So just tackling and managing that, it's a huge task. And that yeah. you know, it can get out of hand. So um, let me just show you what our, for our project, this is kind of interesting. I always like making these when I'm done. You can see that this is the entire um, spec sheet for the, the, the equipment we used on Six Below to be able to effectively have three edit bays cutting and working at 6K with no proxies and no transcodes. So there's a, you know, a lot of stuff in there. Is, is it, it's clear on your side, you can see it? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, you can just eyeball that and just get a sense, but um, yeah, our biggest investment was the Dell Tower because it was like a you know 20 core monster with 128 right. gigs of RAM, but right. that's what we needed to be able to do that. And an interesting story is with Six Below, we actually, I cut the whole feature film in one timeline when I was building out. And so I had a two and a half hour, like first rough cut Ooh. assembly Ooh. of all, all 6K red files in one timeline. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> Fun stuff. And it's funny, uh, a couple of people here, Adam Briggs is saying that he, he learned it the hard way. He was working with 4K uh, and didn't have enough RAM and had to upgrade to 32 gigs with an NVIDIA. And that's what the point I was going to make is even three years ago, when you think about, you know, the RAM limits of most of, of sort of many tower systems and particularly on video cards. I mean, now we're used to 8, 16, 64 dedicated gigs of VRAM. Not not so easy to come by three and a half years ago. So it's, you know, the fact that you were able to do this at all is pretty chilling. And I remember, I mean, I remember you telling me uh, around this time, like, no, we're, we're working with native red files, 6K, you know, yeah. <laughs> 2.35 to one or whatever the aspect was like super ultra wide, you know, and I just remember thinking, my God, you are absolutely pushing it to the limit. But those things continue like it. And what I'm sure what you'll what we're going to see now is because you're editing on a laptop today, right? So that's, I'm editing on a laptop, so I don't yeah. have this system. I wish I had to go down. Right. I'm out in the desert, so I had to go down to a like a, we, a place called The Hive that has like ridiculous internet speeds up and down. I got my own conference room so I can do this, but I'm coming off a laptop, which is for me, it's really limiting because I'm used to like a 49 inch screen and then a huge monitor above. So I'm all like, look how cute this is. But um, it's 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 very interesting for sure. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's always different, right? Yeah. So, but I did bring, what I brought with me was, a, um, you know, I'm gonna work with some scenes and I have a nice scene here. That will be able to break down, and this is the 6K footage here on the on this laptop as well. So it's nice. it's pretty crazy. I might have to go to half resolution or, or whatever. Sure, but um, yeah. but we'll we'll get to that. Okay. But um, so that's the equipment I used, and then um, Premiere Premiere Pro we use. Obviously, I've been on it for so long. Um, so that's our hardware and our software. Now the the second chapter is preferences and and some of our optimization. Um, one thing that I don't think people do enough of is explore the innards of, of, of Premiere Pro to find out like what the options are. 
Um, there's a lot of gotchas. And when you're starting a project, you have to prep everything properly. So um, it's kind of, it's um, really, really important that when you go to your preferences, there's, you know, 120 preferences, I think, all in. And what I wanted to do was kind of hit, a, hit upon the ones that are really important to me in our workflow and some of the things that people might not even know because they are critical. There are certain things that are, if they're not turned on in the preferences, they won't work in the timeline. And the only way to learn that is the hard way by going, why doesn't this work? And you pull your hair out, right? Right, right. So <laughs> what I'd like to do is just plow through these preferences, just point out some of the most important ones for our workflow and hopefully that'll help you. And that's a good start to be able to start a project properly and, and have everything working. So under the awesome. general tab, will you tell me, do you say something? Oh no, I said that's great. I was gonna say, and if you wanna zoom in on some of these, uh, the, the dialogue's a little, it's just a little small. So Is if it? you wanted to, yeah. Um, oh, actually, um, it's, it, it should be it should be legible. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm okay. looking at it on multiple. If screens. someone, I just got I, this is a new laptop, so I don't even know how to zoom in the screen. Oh, okay, that's how no technically worries. I can work circles around Premiere Pro, but I can't zoom into the screen. Let's not let's not have to refigure out the Windows yeah, yeah. architecture. No worries. We're good. Yeah. So, um, working in here, I I leave tooltips on all the time because the good thing about Premiere is like if you hover over something, you want to see what that functionality is, and there's so many options. I always leave that on. Um, one of the other things that's important here is I always like to make sure that when my bins are opening, if I double click on any bin on any tab, that it opens in a tab and doesn't float. One of the best things about Premiere Pro is that everything's connected. And if you do, if you change this option to, to, to what most people do in like Avid and stuff in a new window, it's floating and sometimes gets stuck behind your main screen and you can't see it. So I always make sure that the tabs open, in, you know, next to something that's already attached. Parents wise, you guys are on your own. I don't like to go all the way black. I like to kind of back off so it's a little more, less contrasting mm -hmm. and nice. Mm -hmm. Audio, this is really important. There's a couple of things I'm gonna show later, uh, tomorrow in the audio mixing stuff yeah. that we'll get to. But play audio while scrubbing is important. I always wanna hear what's going on. Uh, maintain pitch while shuttling. I always leave this on so I can play th something at double speed and it stays the same pitch but I can hear more. If I've already looked at all the dailies and we're getting four or five hours of stuff in, I'll go double speed and leave the scrubbing on so I can hear the dialogue and still know what scene I'm in and, and what I'm looking at. Um, same with the maintain pitch. That's why I have to have that on. Uh, right. This is critical. This is a huge automatic waveform generation. If this oh, is yeah. not on, when you first import any of your footage, the waveforms won't be made at that first step and you'll have to do it later. And the worst part is you, when you have your waveforms, if you click this, it'll be created automatically. You can zoom in and out to see those waveforms even while it's playing. You can make adjustments in real time. Um, I know on other NLEs, it has to keep rewriting and rewriting it, and I hate that. I want them done. So automatic waveform generation has to be selected here before you import footage, otherwise you know, you're in trouble. And just and, on that, Audition has that same setting. So you know, in Premiere, we refer to them as the PEKs, and Audition is the PK files, yeah. files, right? The, the bottom, the the bottom right, right of your screen, it's always building when you import new footage. That's it's right. Blue line, progress line. But that's critical. It's a little thing, but if you don't have that and you look for waveforms later, you're not going to have them. Right. So same in audition, right? Yep, absolutely. And one more that's really important in this screen is automated keyframe, sorry, automation keyframe optimization. Um, later, I put it to about almost one second, about three quarters of a second. What this does, and I'll show you uh, tomorrow in the audio section part, is you can ride the faders as the term is and you can change things with the slider the audio value the levels with the slider in real time and it'll make the keyframes for you because when you're actually making keyframes and doing the rubber bands on, a, on an audio track you have to draw them keyframes and go back play it hear if it's good or not stop make adjustments with this you can use the sliders in the audio mixer on the fly, you'll hear the music get louder or quieter. You'll hear the audio get louder or quieter. And when you hit stop, you'll see all the keyframes are drawn for you. So right. for me, that's huge. So I can basically mix live when I'm editing. And that's really yeah. important for music. And you must you must use that or, or have oh, similar yeah. functionality. Absolutely. And actually, and you're, I'm, I zoomed in here, I'm hitting upon, so your minimum time, so your, your linear keyframe thinning, those yes. two elements right there, are key, right? Because as you're pointing out, so I think the default is something like 150 mils. It's 150. It makes so many keyframes that you're, <laughs> you're like, what right. happened? It's insane. So, so just to clarify for everybody, so yeah. if you have the default setting there, when you ride a fader up or down, right? It's a sound piece of sound design or something. 
every 150 milliseconds, it's going to generate a keyframe at your position. So roughly, that's that's a, approximately you know nine or ten in a second. That's way too many, right? Yeah. And you just don't need that many. So by thinning, and my my standard now is between 650 and 750. This is just we're one similar. We're we have the same we're kind of connected, okay. Vashi. Yeah. Um, you're just going to have fewer keyframes, right? So it's kind of like some of the things we've done in Illustrator when you're use it, you know, when you're when you're making curves and lines, and you can thin out the number of points along the path. You don't need 600 for a semicircle. Three is probably all you need. Same concept here for moving faders and automation. It just makes editing the keyframes easier. And of course, you can always manually add more, you know, on the clip in the timeline very easily. So you, you have full flexibility, but that having those, the linear keyframe thinning and setting the uh, minimum time, like I said, I like even between like 500 and 750, kind of depends on the pacing of the material, I guess. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's really the sweet spot and it's not gonna leave you with you know, 300 keyframes for something that is, you know, 20 seconds long. Right. That's just too many. And yeah. we'll go over it tomorrow. But again, this is, it has to be turned on here. Otherwise the functionality doesn't work. So yep. these things go hand in hand. That's why this preference panels are so important and critical. Um, yep. Moving on to audio hardware, obviously you just point it wherever you want. There's, there's not too much that I have to worry about here. Auto save 30 is out of, out of whack. I always do five. Um, I'm crazy like that. And one good thing is like, Pretty much every time if I've had a crash, like five minutes is forever in post-production. If you think about what you could lose in five minutes, so, you know, I just set it to five or, you know, as, as smallest amount possible, as long as it doesn't keep popping up. Um, capture, we don't have to worry about, I don't think we're capturing off decks these days anymore. So we're not worried. Hopefully, hopefully not, but there are some that still do. There are, I, there you are. know, I know you've got the archives as well. I, I'll be the sure. first to say, and I'm curious to see who would, who would say in the chat. I, I get these urges every now and again, like maybe I should transfer those D God help us DV tapes or DV cam, or let's not even think of the analog days because of course oh, I, I had a bunch of them. Right. But all these, all these bizarre digital tape formats from the, you know, early two thousands. I mean, oh boy, you know, that's, and don't forget, let's not forget the beautiful codec HDV. Ooh, the, the, <laughs> we're just going to leave. A bit of a comment for that. Oh, one, yeah. Yeah, HDV, yeah. oh my it God. Was, it was the promise of a new dawn that was never a lie. Yeah, it just never happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right, collaboration. Here's what's critical. If you're working with even one person or two people or working in, on a team project, collaboration is like the latest update, obviously, in Premiere Pro that gives us access to you know productions and all that stuff. If you're enabled project locking, if this is not checked and you don't have your name here, then you're not part of that loop. You're not involved. You cannot collaborate with someone else to access the same information, to share projects, to share sequences. So obviously critical. You could start a new project, a new production, but if this isn't checked, then you're totally out of the loop. So that's yep. super critical. Um, control surfaces, if you have a Wacom tablet, I know a lot of people are using that these days. I'm not. Um, I still, I can't do the pen thing floating. I, it's too touchy for me. So I like a Big old mouse, but that's me. We're seeing a lot more of it, but I, I'm with you. I've never, I've never developed the. I mean, it's a skill, right? It's a skill yeah. to use oh, yeah. pen, and uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm left-handed. I always feel like it's dragging. The tracking is never quite right, and then but it just you know what? All out. of all of David Fincher's editors, from Kurt Baxter, Angus Wall, yes. um, I remember they yes. all use it. They all use right. It. And it's crazy. Have, I mean, again, every the, this is why there are so many of these things. You know, some people love the custom keyboards. Some people are using some of the um, loop deck devices and some yeah. of those other modular, you know, pseudo pseudo uh, deck like things that you know with wheels and knobs and sliders and it's fun and it works for some. I'm I'm very classic and traditional in that way, though. You know, I am too. I uh, old. <laughs> device control again. Next, we have to worry about that. Graphics, nothing that I need to do. Um, this, hopefully, one day I'm still trying to translate some of these colors, as you know. <laughs> but you can, you can change the names here. But you know, I, I like the color spread there. Yeah. Um, media. Um, this is one of the most critical, especially for our project and any project. Almost every production now, you'll get uh, camera footage that's either 4K, 6K, 8K, all these different Ks, different sizes, and when you import it. You don't want to resize every single shot and every every camera when you bring it in your timeline. So this one's probably the most important for for setting up a project if you know you're going to have different camera sizes, different codecs, different everything's. Uh, default media scaling set to frame size. 
what this does is this ensures that you gain access to every pixel. Um, right. And when you make your timeline, let's say just it's HD, it's 1920 by 1080. If you bring in 4K, 6K, 8K, it will, it will not sample it. It won't change the footage. It'll just censor it. And when you look at the size, the actual scale of it in your, in your effects, you'll see that it's like 25% or 22%. So it's scaling it down and scaling down every shot from every camera, no matter what the size. So it fits within the 1920, uh, 1080 timeline or 2K or whatever timeline you create, but it guarantees that you have access to it. So when you zoom into those shots, you'll actually see real pixels and not some fake stuff that you know how is that right. how you <laughs> interpolated <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, gross looking hey by the way uh greg brocco just i i love this it's just classic he still has his jvc br dv6000 ouch so, yeah right <laughs> oh, that's pain uh, i mean i remember those days you know yeah. and uh i i i don't miss them but there's every now and again i do have a longing for like deck control same with you know in the studio here i have some classic da88s yeah. which I used to use for audio posts for video. And I don't know, there is something about that tactile feel of the remote. But then I think of all the setup and the maintenance and just yeah. the physical weight. I mean, this thing weighs like 200 pounds, you know. Don't date, <laughs> don't date yourself, Jason. Oh, well, too late. You know the, the silver has already done it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just pl plowing through this, uh, enable proxies. If you're going to work with proxies, and you're going to import high res footage and make proxies with Premiere, it has to be on here as well. So if this is not enabled, then you can't make, you can't ingest and make actual proxies of your size, be it, you know, 720 or 1080, whatever. So it has to be checked here. This one's hilarious. Allow duplicate media during project import. That should not even be there. No duplicate yeah. media. Yeah. And so that's, that's our, never check that one. That's the most important one there um, in terms of, for me um, on, on this page. Um, Media cache, Jason, I know you'd recommend the same thing. It, it should not be on your main boot drive. It should be on an external drive every single time. If you can get an SSD to hold your cache files, even better. Yeah. Um, again, we're trying to get the best performance out of whatever NLE we're working with, but for Premiere Pro, it's always best to keep that separate. Um, that's just, you know, not common. It's not common sense because some people will just be like, just put it on my boot drive. Who cares? Let's just start cutting. Right. And that, that, energy that you take to start cutting is is great and you've got to value that right. but you've got to set up stuff so you can have and, optimized and that one start. is so critical too because like you said a lot of times even if it's just oh let me just quickly cut this it just especially if you're dealing with 4k and above i yeah. mean 1080 you know a small little promo piece it's it's not going to matter but it is one of those i don't always love saying best practices but it's a practice that you should employ which is if you're going to be cutting something that you know is doesn't have to be long form but that is just going to be using media big media lots of media put it on an external drive totally put put the scratches over there you're just the whole your experience will be better and again yeah. you'll maintain that editing energy rather than the frustration of like you know trying to do asynchronous uh Ugh. um yeah back and forth read and write on yeah, your, yeah. On your C oh, drive the same drive it's going to start yeah. smoking your computer is just going to blow up um yeah. this is one that a lot of people sometimes don't look into but um i'm working in premiere i have 128 gigs of ram on this laptop i want to assign as much as possible to premiere for myself and then leave 12 gigs for you know if i open media encoder if i open after effects but if I'm just cutting, I want to assign as much RAM to it and then make sure that my performance, my rendering is set to performance. Again, I want to try and eke out every inch of power and performance from all these components. And if you set up your pro your computer and your workflow properly, it's incremental, but it does add up and you get more power and more performance. Um, if you just if you didn't have this, if you just had it like, oh, whatever, just split it, then you're going to you know lose power. You know, so that's mm -hmm. important. Um, Playback, obviously, you have to have Mercury Transmit. I love cutting on like a big 65-inch screen next to my main system. And even off the yeah. laptop, I, I love the feeling. It's very immersive. So I always try and have one big monitor separate from my editing monitors. And if that's not on, then you can't watch on another monitor. Sync settings, I'm not going to worry about. Um, there's a couple of things here that are really important. And then we'll be just about done. Um, when you're editing... And we're going to get to that later today is uh, set focus on the timeline when performing insert overwrite edits. It sounds like a mouthful. Like it's like, what does that mean? This basically means if you're cutting, if you have a, a sequence 
or you have something in the source monitor, if this is on, when you hit in out and hit insert, it'll know to put it in the timeline that's active. So you don't have to, if you have several timelines open, it's, it's going to say, where do you want me to put this? So whatever the active timeline is, it guarantees that from one timeline to another or from the source monitor to the timeline you're cutting into, this will ensure that it saves you like a keystroke every single time. You don't want to write in, out, and then use your mouse to select, select the timeline you want to use and drag it in. It just saves you a step, but it's super, super critical. Yeah. Um, Snap Playhead, again, this is so important. Like I love my mouse and my cursor and, and to be able to grab the edge of any edit or grab the edge. If it's not on here, if this is not enabled, you could still turn it on in the timeline, but it won't work. And you'll literally go crazy going, why? I have Snap enabled, but I can't use Snap. So again, it's buried in these preferences and that's why it's so important to plow through these and look at it. And that's why I'm just trying to hit upon the my, my favorite ones that are most important. Um, this one's the other critical one for editing, especially when you're replacing shots or trying to use a source footage. Match frame sets in point. Um, I'll be able to demonstrate it later, but basically yeah. if you hit match frame, it goes to the source to the source monitor where that clip lives. And wherever you set the in point, that's what will match when you put it back into the timeline. Yeah. So if you don't have that on, it'll use the first frame of the shot, which is usually a slate or the sky. Not what you want, right. Or, or the ground. So by turning this one on, it guarantees that whatever the endpoint is in your source monitor, it's the it's the clip and the shot that you want at the right time, and that's going in. And these are all just like they just save time, and all these accrued on top of each other. Will once you master it and play with it, you'll see like okay, I, your editing um, becomes quicker and more efficient, and and the computer just kind of like disappears, right? And you're just thinking about all right, I want to cut, I want to drop this and that, and that's super, super important to me. And lastly, this one, trim, you know, you can, you do, do what you want. I like to have, I like to have the red arrows in my timeline, not the yellow. Mm -hmm. I'd yeah. rather, you know, if you're editing, there's, there's ripple editing and then there's just normal editing. If you have the red arrow at the edge of a clip, I think it's critical that I like to make a hole and see the hole. I don't like to ripple delete because everything moves and I can't see how much I've moved it. And right. do that times a thousand, and then I, I just feel paranoid that there's I've made a mistake or I moved something that shouldn't be moved. I like to make holes and then close them. So see, and the, and, and actually, and, and two things just on that because I know I know we're going to move into ingest and stuff, but yeah, um, this was so two things. One is you know we added that feature, close the gaps. Yes, a couple of versions ago. Which if I correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you were among the the top five people like recommending that workflow specifically for this reason. And we get asked this a lot, like, well, what's the difference between sort of magnetic style editing, which of course we have in Rush yeah. and other LEs do this versus the way that Premiere does it by default. And of course we're leaving the holes by default. Um, yeah. And for, for many reasons, I know you're gonna discuss these, but I wanna point out, and maybe we'll get a chance to show it too, that keyboard shortcut, which you can set up to close the gaps so valuable, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm the same way. I like to leave the gap to know maybe I'm going to insert something here. Maybe this yeah. was there was a moment I want to extract, find a better take. Ah, I can just leave it out. Or if you have gap. music, if you have a music or track music. underneath, yeah. that can't be moving. You I, you know you set your music to, to hit certain points and it has to time out. So, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, and you just got a wonderful comment from Michelle. Oh, damn, that match frame set endpoint is what I was looking for for a long time. I thought Premiere was designed the way I used it till now. So. It's always really <laughs> and what I wanted to say, I forgot to mention earlier because we just dove in so quickly. I have um, all these chapters that we're talking about. I have a, a like a 69 page PDF that goes in specific detail about my workflow. And it's 69 pages long that covers all of this. There's a link I'll show at the end that you right. can just go download it. And so it's free. You don't need anything. It's just my workflow distilled down. So I'm pulling from that in terms of like the most important points for each of these sections that given our time constraints, you know, we could go round and round on this. Nice. So you'll be, I'll be able to show that at the end. Um, so next I would want to go to ingest and syncing, right? So one thing, the biggest mistake most people make when they're starting a project in Premiere Pro is that they go here and they double click in the panel and they start browsing around and looking for files and, and whatnot. Um, you can do that um, if something goes south or if you go grab a red file that has like 25 folders before you get to that and you wanna import all those folders, go ahead, that's fine. 
Um, it's not the best way and neither is file import. It's there if you want it. I can't find it. There it is. So there's file import. You can do that again, but you're using basically the, the finder of the OS and not, not something within Premiere. Right. Um, every time someone reaches out to me and I deal with a lot of uh, helping people in terms of they have problems or questions and I get them all day long. Anytime someone says the, the, the footage I'm importing is corrupted or it doesn't come in properly, or there's no audio or whatever. I say, oh, did I do that? Or oh, you I just switched go. switched I over switched. from Premiere, yeah. Oh, there you go. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna reopen uh, oh. Premiere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna reopen it just to try, you know, every thirty minutes. Just gotta bump it up again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. Yeah, here we go. This um, is live, you know. That's yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah, believe me, feel you. Yeah. So the secret to making sure that you're actually getting the right footage in and the, the best way to access it and everything is to use Media Browser. Um, Media Browser is the finder built into Premiere Pro that gives you first look at everything. You can actually see the footage, you can interact with it. If there's merged footage that spreads out, if you're using cards or SD cards and it, and it puts footage across two of them in your camera, if you have two cards, this will see it as one file when you ingest it. If you use the other import method of just double clicking, you'll probably get pieces and parts that don't connect and all the metadata is not attached to it. So my biggest thing with Premiere Pro that I love is the tilde key, the top left under the escape. Yep. So anywhere I'm hovering, it just makes it full screen. If I want to look at the timeline in full screen, I hit the tilde key. I do this all day long. If I'm editing on a laptop, I want to zoom in like this. Uh, I can see everything. That's fine. When I bounce out the tilde key, it goes back to that size. So wherever I'm looking, tilde key, I'm I'm going full screen all day long, even for the export or my program monitor. I have it in there. So in Media Browser, if I want to drill down and import something, um, I had some raw footage here. Um, if I'm just looking at this stuff, I can see all this, and if I hit the, obviously, the thumbnail, then I can see all the footage, including, oh, look at that. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> so, so what's really cool about this is, obviously, I'm interacting with the footage. I can see where it is. I'm looking at my 6K footage on all these different places, and I can import it from this point, and I know that I'm going to get everything in properly, that all the components and metadata is coming in. Um, I can grab stuff. I can hit one, two, three, whatever I want, use my, my keys and then import it. Here's one trick that uh, most people don't know um, that I use all the time is if I'm importing something from here, if I go and touch a bin over here, so if I do Adobe Video Live Bashi, then if I go to Media Browser and I import something, it will go into that folder yep. directly. Most people will have nothing activated. So when you import, it just floats it in your in your program. You have a huge list of raw media. And yeah. you have like 100 files in there. And then they, sometimes if it's alphabetical, it gets blended in with everything else that you have in there. So always just touch, just touch the folder you want it, the bin that you want it to go to. Then when you import it on this side, then you'll be able to, you know, just right click import. It'll go into that last folder that you had touched. So I think like that's like, I know it's a minor thing, but it makes a huge difference when you're, you know, trying to get your footage in. And on most productions on our film, we have five or six hours of footage that comes in and it has to be positioned and put in the right place. So media browser is probably, you know, when we're talking about optimization and like getting the footage into Premiere Pro to start cutting, that's one of the most, most critical. Um, once it's in, obviously, we want to start making a sequence and do that stuff. Um, I know, it's, again, I have the sequence here that we're working with, and I'm going to just show you what it is. And I'm going to show you one other little trick that I use all the time that, that solves so many problems. Um, I was going to say, raise your hand if. And right, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, smile inside if you've ever had a project where – you try and render it out and you get like a glitch somewhere. If there's a dissolve or some kind of like, you know, dip to black, there's always some kind of glitch and you can't do anything and you turn off your GPU renderer and you have to do a software export only where it takes three times longer. Yes. Almost 99% of the time it's this sucker here. By default, it's on for every sequence that's created within Premiere yeah. Pro. Composite and linear color requires GPU. 
if this is on, I will often get that glitch where something happens or there's some weird interactions, especially if I have effects and I'm blending stuff. Turn this off, like do yourself a favor, um, always have it off, don't worry about, there's no GPU acceleration that can help solve that. But that has literally solved so many people's problems. I'm like, do you have that on when you export it? Yes, turn it off. Oh my God, it worked. Yes. Right. So yeah. I, and I don't know why, like, I don't know, maybe you know what the mechanics behind it is or what the difference between linear color and log color. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, and I'm trying to remember when we put this in and it was something to do, I, I want to say at the time, it was something to do with when you were moving footage, particularly like between After Effects and Premiere, right? Okay. Because there was a period where we didn't, we all, we, I can't remember, we did, we only did linear color or we didn't do, I can't remember the exactly, but yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those gotchas too, where if you are experiencing strange little glitches on export uh, with those preview files, that nine times out of 10 will cure that issue on export. Yeah, exactly. So it's just a little thing that, you know, you could, if you beat your head on the wall, you'll never figure it out. But if you, you hear it or someone says it, then you're like, oh, cool. Thanks for the tip. Uh, while we're here in the sequence setting, one more thing to be aware of is Always try and set, if you're gonna have video previews, set it to match your final export that you're gonna create. If you're making a video for the web, like I right. upload 422 proxy for YouTube videos. It's you know, right. 38 uh, megabits, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice fat file. So I'll set my previews. So when I, if I do a really intricate edit and I export it, it's using these proxy uh, yep. preview files to make the final file. So I'm not rendering every single time. It's using what I've already, created yeah. and it cuts my render time down to like 10 seconds for you know, yeah i mean minutes. significantly right yeah i mean that's the yeah. thing if you're using the previews as you go you could have a 30 minute piece and oh, yeah. if everything's using the previews it's it can literally be seconds if you're expert yes. i mean it's maybe a minute but it's significantly less time if you're leveraging them for sure and totally. also i would point out too i know you've already got it set to pro uh, prores proxy but i think the default is still like iframe yeah. MPEG for whatever yeah. reason so that needs to be changed to me <laughs> I mean, I, if you need if you need iframe, use it. But I don't know too many people who are using that for preview files. So best to best to go with QuickTime. And of course, the nice thing is, as you're pointing out, being on Windows, we now support ProRes exactly. yeah. natively Native. back in Windows. So no reason not to be leveraging um, ProRes, ProRes Proxy. There you go. Everything. everything should be 444 XQ. Everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Maybe not, but yes, you can. <laughs> Right. But proxies, proxies, amazing size wise. I love it. Yeah. Um, while we're in here, if you have a, if you have a sequence that you set up like that, that's like one of the other ones, like the red files or whatever, you have to go to custom in this editing mode to get access to this. If you're in another mode, it sometimes will not allow you to see QuickTime because it's not associated with that preset that's already been built. So whatever sequence you're in, if you don't have access, if you go down here and you don't see QuickTime as an option, then go up to the top and just change it to custom. Nothing else will change. Just the name will right. change to custom. And then the access to this proxy files will be available to you. So that's mm -hmm. just a little thing. And what are your thoughts on that? I usually recommend to people because I think that's another one of those drop downs because there's so many presets in there. Yeah. 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 It's really daunting. I And I guess if you know exactly specifically, and I mean, again, even if you're just looking at like some of the IMX, I mean, there's, there's 50, 60 flavors of some of those codecs in there. I usually tell people just start with custom. Right? Yes. It's just kind of- It gives you access clean. to everything. It gives you access to everything, yeah. And you can custom flavor to, the, to your setting and, and you're fine. Right. Um, and you know what you shot, right? right? So it just makes life a lot easier. Right. And yeah. one, more, one more thing with that, when we're talking about setting up a sequence, because there are so many settings, one trick I use all the time is, this is a uh, red file here. If I put it up here, we can see. If I right click on the file in my in my program, or sorry, in my uh, project, if I right click on it and say new sequence from clip, it will match my red footage and match everything for me automatically. So now when I go to sequence and see the settings, you'll see that it's 6K footage, you know, da 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 da, this is on. I turn that off, go away. All right. And then you can see here, it's it's already right. I right. right. <laughs> change that to you know whatever. I'll, I'll change the proxy for this. Can you, so, is, can you even do iframe MPEG in six K? I'm a. I guess. I don't, do you want to crash Premiere? Yeah, to yeah. But let's. This is not good. Let's not go. So there. so the, so you see. So if you right click on any clip in your stuff, change to yes, that's fine. 
So if you right click anywhere and then you um, new sequence from clip, you'll get a clip that's that matches all the settings and you can see, and this is cool. Like what was funny with Six Below is uh, we had, it's Josh Hartnett is the lead and we had Mira Servino and we had to do takes where he would go through actions that took like sometimes 10 minutes. And so we were rolling 10 minute shots. And this is all real snow, by the way, there's no fans. We actually, right, 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 right. Um, but we're looking at, you know, 6K footage on the laptop right now, Red just red raw files just watching it and you know if you on an external monitor on a 65 inch holy smokes does that look crisp and pretty yeah i, I just want to point out too for everyone watching like we are what we're looking at native red 6k playing on a laptop at half res immediately yeah. uh, admittedly let but me try let me try let you're me not go. dropping any frames i don't know if everyone can see in the bottom left hand corner the of the premiere panel there the green we're not dropping any frames. Let's go to full. Let's go to full res. So full res. You're gonna, you're gonna brave it. All right, full res. I just see green. We're I not see, dropping frames. Yeah. That's freaking amazing. So that's yeah, six K red raw file, full resolution, not dropping, not even one frame. All right. So Lucas is saying it's hard to resist the urge to drop raw footage into the new item button. <laughs> I know it is. Right? It is. But this is a testament. Like my the desktop that we used. Three years ago, the Dell couldn't do this. Right, we had, right. We had to do half half res to get full playback. It's, so now I'm on a laptop bad. that I get full res at you know 6K. And it's playback. really coming over nicely. I mean, even over the stream, we're getting like true. It looks like you got to walk. Always yeah, walk I mean, into a close up. Yeah, right. <laughs> Always walk into a close up. Uh, you exactly. know what's funny? If you look in his goggles, you can see the whole crew. You yes. Oh, a, yes. <laughs> so I, just, row, and then I just zoomed in myself right there. Yeah. Um, you can see everyone off to his row. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, on his right side, like over his his, his mm -hmm. right eye. Yeah, everyone's all stacked up. Now, is that something that you did you bother to mask that out in any way oh, in post? Or? That you ask. Yes, mm -hmm. we had to create a mask for the goggles right. and then match it with like shooting in the other direction. So, right. Be, right. I mean, so, we had to shoot a clean plate basically and map it onto his goggles for all these shots. Oh my gosh. And he wears them a lot. He's, he's snowboarding. And I didn't even say what six blows about. It was about um, the character played by Josh Hartnett, who is a snowboarder. He goes out in the wilderness, gets lost during a blizzard and is stuck out there for seven days and does survive. But it's his, his journey. It is, it's trying to piece his life together and thinking back to what he had done and what, what caused him to get here and his decisions over his life. So it's a very introspective and emotional film, and um, Josh did an amazing job, like bearing, you know, dealing with the environment, and he was fully committed. We, they, we shot for five weeks up. This is just north of Sundance, up in the mountains. Like oh, wow. they had to take uh, um, SUVs to one point, then the entire crew had to get on snowmobiles to get to the chalet that they stayed at, and then from there they had to take snowmobiles or walk to the locations. So those. There's no Wi-Fi, no nothing. It's in the middle of nowhere. So that's, um, I'm glad we got the playback. I'll just turn it to half just in case. Right. I don't want to. Okay, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> hey, we we got it at least once. That's good enough. Yeah. And it's funny, uh, uh, Callum Hayes is saying, uh, you should have used content to wear Phil on AE. That wasn't, in, that hadn't been invented yet for uh, <laughs> exactly. in 2017. So yeah, it would have saved you today. But um, yeah, that wasn't around at that time. You would, If anything, you, you could have done it as a frame sequence in Photoshop, but it was probably easier just to take the clean plate and we just kicked it, it over in. using dynamic link, which we'll go over right. on, you know, tomorrow. Really same thing. Yeah. Oh, so yes. Yeah, so we're gonna cover that tomorrow too. Yeah. And then awesome. so like and again, like dynamic link, I, you know, that's gonna be exciting to talk about. But like again, working with Fincher's team and watching them work, as you know, Jason, 95% of every shot in a Fincher film or project goes to After Effects through Dynamic Link so they can stabilize, do split screens, do additional work. And that it's just insane to have that kind of power and access within using Premiere Pro as the hub, right? Mm -hmm. Then sending stuff to After Effects, sending stuff to Audition to do my audio tweaks that, that are more intricate than I can do in Premiere. It's it's a perfect combination and to watch other professionals and you know use it and, and benefit from it. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're dealing with these little, huge, massive films, or little oh, ones, yeah. or little ones. Well, and Mallory Durick uh, over on Adobe Live is saying uh, she needs to watch this movie right now. So <laughs> you've inspired her. You know. There we go. 
and we're, and we're getting a lot of comments too about just like thank you for all these all these little hidden tips it, it truly is these little things and again you're getting more questions about the what kind of monster laptop we did discuss that earlier in the stream so you can find it at the beginning it's a dell 128 gigs of ram um did you mention what the vram no, is it's, on? A dell, it's a dell 7750 7750 okay so it's a 17 inch 4k monitor um yeah it's a i think eight core and then 128 gigs of ram i maxed it out because i was like I'm editing mobily more often now. And if I go to any production, I know that this laptop can handle, you know, 8K footage at half res for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful and within a laptop solution, just to show up with a laptop and actually be able to cut and not wait to for, for uh, proxies or transcodes, just start right. cutting. It gives me, an, uh, a, I think, a benefit. It gives me an edge on other people that could show up and do the job. I'm like, I can start cutting right now. Let's go. Totally. Totally. So not a plug, yeah. not a plug for Dell, even though I use it and love it, but it's just it just happens to be that that's what works. I want to use the gear and the hardware and software that works that I'm comfortable with. Right. It's a, it's a nice mix. Nice. All right. So oh, and uh, Reverb Mike is saying, "Yep, Lowe's look like the same conditions at the end of The Shining with frozen Jack Nicholson." Yeah. <laughs> there is actually a shot in here where you would swear. Um, it, it was it was based on that. Oh yeah. right, little little Kubrick esque uh, nod yeah. somewhere in there. Oh, oh what's, cool. I wanna, what I want to show you the scene that we're gonna I'll show you later. Here's the actual shot with the the grade because we shot you know day for what, day for night. So right. this is this is some of the final imagery from the film when he he walks up. Um, actually, let me back it up a little bit to just before. Um, and I can't wait to get to, to some of these examples because it's really cool. So here's the same shot, I believe, yeah, from right. before. And so this was shot during the daytime. If you see all those stars, right. this is really cool. Those stars are actual plates that we shot of real stars. And then oh, we the had night sky. Oh, the night nice. sky. And we matted it through. We had to roto through the trees and everything. And so here's the shot where he walked into it and we have it framed. Um, we cropped the top and bottom to get that um, 276. Right. Oh, 276, uh, right. 276, same as like the, you know, the Hateful Eight and the, the yep. older films. But mm -hmm. that's the shot he walked into and they had to do a lot of work to get that. But that's just a quick peek, at, you know, something. And then you have obviously on the other side you have that's the original shot. The actual, the actual shot. And I love this. I can't wait. To, I know we're, we're not doing grading till later, but man, that's just so awesome. You're getting a lot of, whoa, that's awesome in the chats because that's really, that really speaks to just the, the power of grading and what's what's oh, yeah. possible. In the you tone know. sense, yeah. Right, totally. Wow. Right. So we'll, Completely we'll, different we'll tone. Get to that. But yeah, it's, this is insane to me because I, I, I'll find the shot, the uncolored one. It's literally daytime, the snow is blowing, but the sky is completely like white and cloudy. And the sky replacement here was just spectacular. And those are because we had to deliver a 6K version of this film for Barco, which is a three screen system that we had one of our right. deliverables. We actually had 14 different deliverables that we had to oh, give at the end. So that was one of them. But they needed a 6K image. There were no star plates, whatever, that were big enough to put it in the sky because if you right. if you stretched them out, it was just like a whole bunch of moons, like right, thousands right. of moons in the sky. So John Carr, um, the VFX editor on this, and you know John, he yep. shot these plates in Colorado up in the mountains. He went up one late night. Oh, wow. and so those are real stars, real size with an 8K capture camera. So wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. They're coming through so clear, cleanly over the stream. I was going to, before oh, you said, are. I was wondering like, oh, that's got to be After Effects, right? No, those are actual, so it's an actual it's a photo. Yeah, but we did do yeah. After Effects to map it, sorry, map sure. it behind. Right, and then right. Wrote but they weren't that. generated there. Right, yeah. No, those that's are amazing. real. That's so yeah, again, it's it, it's just fun. It's fun, Jason. Yes, Frederick would agree. Totally amazing. All, All right. these little things, and I appreciate everyone being patient because I know it's sometimes like I'm not going to come here and show. Look in, out, insert. Like that's how we make it. No, it's like these are the important things, the takeaways that we had to learn the hard way that we're trying to pass on, and trying to make it just an easier process for post production, make it a more enjoyable process. You know. Um, speaking of one last thing I didn't talk about before, we have all our preferences, but there's one more um, section that you have to be aware of, which is project settings. Um, it's under file project settings general. This is super critical. If this is not on your renderer, um, I use NVIDIA Quadro cards. This laptop has an RTX 5000 and then oh, nice. 
so it's a big boy. And then at home on my Dell Tower, I have another RTX, but not none. Not, I haven't got one of the new ones yet. I still have like an M6000 from like three oh, years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> very powerful, and I'm very yep. grateful for that. But just make sure that your Mercury playback engine is on, um, because without that, you literally you'll get the red line, the timeline, meaning it has to be rendered before export, and you'll get poo poo playback. Right. So you're not going to sure you're not going to get that. Uh, you're not going to see that green light trying to play back. No, exactly. Okay. Um, and it's worth pointing out too, as you're dropping that down. So again, now uh, the the CUDA driver, which goes along with NVIDIA, is is a separate install. Though your OS is probably installing some of that, but you also have OpenCL here. And then, of course, on the Mac side, you'll see Metal, uh, Metal yes, which is the default equivalent there. And a lot of people are always asking. CUDA, you know, better, faster than, than metal. And in some cases, yes, especially with some of the new things that they've done. Um, but you get pretty decent performance with metal as well. And I, I, I will say going software only, almost never. In a, in, no. in a pinch, if I have to for some reason, because something is happening, maybe. But that's but, only if it glitches. If I'm getting glitches on export, and then I, that, and I'm on a deadline, I'd, I'll turn off and I'll eat it. I'll go get a sandwich and a coffee and a vodka, and then I'll come back and it'll be done. But, but yeah, this is where you'd access it at Supercritical. You see that um, Nvidia bought ARM. Oh yeah, forty <laughs> billion dollars or forty-one billion. Couple, couple pennies there. So yeah. Sorry for the side note, but so ARM is going to make the new Apple chips. Is that correct? Right. I, but I think so. Yes. Someone, I'm sure someone knows. Them. Yeah. We'll see, but that's a hefty investment. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, one last thing on this page uh, here on the bottom, it's hidden, not hidden, but just like kind of off by itself. Display the project item name and label color for all instances. If this is on checked, then the color of anything in your bin will match what's in your timeline. If you turn this right. off, Jason, correct, then you can have separate colors in your timeline and the same clip in your project will be a different color. Yep. So you can change stuff around and it won't ripple back and forth. So yep. checked exactly. means it matches. Unchecked means you can have a free for all. None of the colors have to match. Right. And that's just a personal preference, right? If you're if you're kind of very into the consistency of how you're doing things and labeling. Yeah. Things, makes sense. One, I've seen this where we turn it off because someone will want to highlight something in the timeline and change it right. all to blue or something to, yep. to make it obvious mm -hmm. that this needs to be worked on. But um, I'll show you shortly. I use markers for that, and I put them above, and then I can mm -hmm. mark a section of the timeline. Um, so that's it. So that's the last of the just the behind the under the hood kind of things you should be aware of to try and optimize and, and do everything um, inside your project. Um, I know that we had like you know we were talking about like basic editing. I I don't think it, it's going to help anyone if I like show you know if I just load something to source and whatever. Um, but I know we have a lot of people and a lot of different stuff. Is there, are there any questions that need answering before we, we move on? No, I'm, I'm tackling them all. We're, we're getting a lot of questions around, again, just around some of these optimizations and certain yeah. things. Uh, we're, we're basically, we're answering them all and I'm answering them back and forth. So we're, we're good to, we're good to okay. keep on moving. Okay, nice. Uh, one thing I also do is I like to turn off, I like, to, especially on a laptop, I'll turn off all my uh, show transport controls. I don't use these buttons up per se up here. I want to try mm -hmm. and gain a little, Real estate. Oh, real estate, so, yeah. yeah I, I turn those off and I try and s literally, I have, you know, different window workspaces that I've created, but I like to have the minimum amount. Um, yep. Adobe is amazing. Premiere Pro is amazing in terms of you can have every single one of, uh, what was I looking for? Oh, window. So all the, oh, my mouse is walking. So everything on the left here, everything on here is a panel that you can have open on the bottom here. So that's a lot of stuff to, to have on your thing. I try and pare it down to the bare essentials and I try and stack everything in, in one spot here, markers being one of them. Yeah. So I just try to have, you know, my project source program and timeline and then meters just so I know if I'm blowing something out audio wise. Right. <laughs> right. I, I don't want to see red. I want to see green's good, no red. Right. But, um, well, actually let me just, I'm sorry, I just want to not brag, but I just want to show like, here's some of the, we actually had a professional snowboarder, one of the most famous guys in the world who filmed all this stuff. And it was just, it was just ridiculous. Like the things that, that they went through and the, the actuality and the real stuff. But um, that was some cool stuff. So, oh, okay, yeah. so we're, we're back in um, optimization. I think we're, we're done with that. Uh, one thing, last thing for optimization is always make sure that wherever, Whatever panel you're on, always look for the wrench 
to see what your options are. Right. Um, there's so many presets again that I, we could spend four hours on just presets and like what makes it good and what makes it, how to customize it. But it's, that's not the, the point of this. The other thing is every panel has the little hamburger menu where again, there's more presets, more options. And it's really important to try. If you don't know, then like poke around, try that, read about it. You only have to do it once and you'll learn a lot of stuff. Once we get into audio editing tomorrow, when I get to show audio time units, people are going to freak out. You know, yep. it's it looks so nondescript here. You're like, what does that even mean? Like, it's right. game changer. I, 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 and I'm still one of those who's saying uh, nomenclature wise, wording wise, I, I don't I don't know how we're still doing the audio time unit thing. What it should say is samples. Yeah, because that's what say, you're actually seeing. Yes, you should say samples. samples. Yep, and then it's clear. And I've shown that I've um, in in Ace. I've taught about fifty other Ace American Cinema editors, other editors like the editors of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Star Wars, all this stuff. I've worked with them to help them get comfortable with Premiere. And I think it's yeah. important to note, um, I'm completely NLE agnostic. Like I've cut features on right. Avid Media Composer. I've cut seven on Premiere Pro, a couple on Final Cut, seven back in the day. But it's important to know as many platforms as you, as you can. But it really impressed me that some of these older editors that are really established are, were coming to me and coming to Adobe saying, teach me Premiere Pro. I hear everyone's using it. I don't want to be left out of the loop. I don't want to be offered a job and not know how to use it. And that's one thing that I really appreciate, like the open-mindedness of other editors and people that want to improve themselves. I think mm -hmm. the, the hallmark of, of not failure, but just like limiting, limiting yourself is if you have a credit a business card or something and you say, I'm a Premiere editor or I'm an avid editor, right? It's like yeah. you've literally just X yourself out of like 50% of the jobs by taking not an allegiance, but just saying I'm being defined by my right. NLE. Yeah. Which Instead is of not, being, I'm a film editor. I'm a storyteller. Yes. You know, I only play what, Yamaha pianos. Yeah, here. exactly. Who would do that? Right. Right. So again, <laughs> anything you want to do, but if I'm a producer or something and I, I know we're cutting on premiere and, and I see I'm a, on your resume, I'm an avid editor. I'm like, all right. I but, won't play Baldwin's though, Vashi. I refuse. I don't come like the on. Sound of Baldwin I heard they're yet. nice. Baldwin's no, nice. Those I don't. Steinways? Not, nothing against them. Uh, Steinway's okay. Busendorfer, love, but I'm really a I'm a Yamaha guy. Um, okay. So just a couple of quick things before we keep moving on. So, um, so there's a question here about what what elements of automation is placed in Premiere. Is it possible to use elements of a screenwriting software to make a template for editing? So. This is, while this isn't directly related to what we're doing, so the short answer is n n not really. So we, we are some third-party things, third-party plugins that you can use to kind of help automate script and tie sort of script and dialogue and things together for better editing, but not exactly in that way. Now, we used to have a software called Adobe Story, which I know, Vashi, you were intimately familiar with. I was. Well, I did use it, yeah. Absolutely. Which kind of was sort of uh, Chilimboy kind of worked in the fashion that you're sort of describing. But uh, I mean, there are, look, we have a lot of partners where you can have different sort of automated panels that can do certain things that, to, that can control and work inside of Premiere, but natively, not really so much. True. All right. Okay. Um, then let me get into now that we've seen everything and like we've imported footage. Um, there's many ways to edit, and obviously the, the the simplest is opening a bin, turning on your thumbnails, looking through stuff, loading it into your source, choosing your in and out, and then inserting that into the timeline wherever my playhead is. Um, I forgot what my I don't think I have my keyboard shortcuts, but anyways, I'll do the. I've been you know what I've been using a lot is mm -hmm. dragging this to this monitor. That's right. And being Drop able zone. to insert before the playhead, insert where right where it is, insert after, or replace if I'm hovering over another shot. This I've actually turned into using quite a bit because it has so many options and I can just drag and drop as needed on whatever option I want because otherwise it's a keyboard shortcut. So mm -hmm. I, I do like obviously using keyboard shortcuts to get it in, but if I have a specific task, I really do like this and how, this has only been around for like a year or two, right? It's a couple like, of years. Couple this was years actually ago. just this, just this past Friday on my uh, Adobe Live Masterclass. This was one of the features that I showed because this is, it's truly a hidden gem because you wouldn't discover it. And most people only discover it where because they by accident dragged a little to too right. far to the right before yeah. dragging down. Yeah. <laughs> and went, what the heck was that? There's no way to discover it otherwise. And it's so useful because like you, 
Uh, if I do, I, you know, you know me, I'm not a huge keyboard shortcut person, but if I move systems and I don't sync and I don't remember what they are, that's that's inevitably what I wind up using rather than just dragging from the source down into the timeline. Right. Um, and it's so useful. And there's so many options there too, based on, again, if you're doing so, if you're using source targeting or track targeting, you have lots of different other things you can do there, which is super cool. Totally. So that's one way of like, you know, editing where you have, you know, and in here, if I do the tilde key, you know, I can see I have whatever, 20, 20 separate shots in this scene that I have. So I don't like like looking and hunting and, and going like this and, then, and seeing stuff. What I prefer to do is do a, a camera roll or a string out, which goes back to the old yeah. days of film where all oh, the yeah. film that was shot on the day was put together and put on a big reel. And that would look like this. So this is a string out or a camera roll where all the footage from one day is laid out chronologically how we shot it. So we have, this is only 45 minutes of footage, this chunk and 45 <laughs> more minutes here. Yeah, so it's in its own timeline and if I zoom in, you can see, and it has, you know, I'll just scroll through. It has every take from that day from the different shots that we did. And it's just very straightforward and we have wolves. I like wolves, look how pretty, hi wolf. Mm -hmm. It was really hard to make wolves look angry because they didn't want to get angry. <laughs> So we had to, it was it was hard. We had to find little moments when they got snippy, like those teeth. Um, so everything's laid out in one timeline. Oh, here's since I'm here, here's the shot at nighttime, the original. This is what we started with. Right. And you had the stars in the sky in the background, yeah. and it's it's dark. So that's what it looks like. The original camera footage, negative, just right out of the camera. Um, so by putting all the footage in here, what I like to do as an editor is every new shot. Um, that's a new like setup, I'll drop a marker in the timeline. So I have one marker here at the first frame, um, okay? And then another marker here. And then if, it, if we change to a new angle, this is a new angle, I'll just guess. Um, here's our footage. I'll drop a marker at every new shot. And what happens is, sorry, every new setup. So I then use a combination of keyboard shortcuts. If I use the down arrow, it goes to the next edit point. So I'm going, to the next shot. If I use my next marker, I'm going to the first shot in the next setup. Yep. So between four keyboard shortcuts of uh, one going to the next marker, forward and backward, and up and down arrows to go to the next shot, I can quickly see and navigate towards where I want to, where the shot is. Now on my markers panel, if I activate this, you'll see all the shots that I made markers at. And then obviously my assistant or someone will write, you know, scene one, scene two, right. scene three, scene all four, in here. Metadata, which yeah, is can... worth pointing out, this was also part of my little uh, uh, hidden it gems. Was. All of that becomes, I'm telling you, dude, cosmically connected. All yeah. of that becomes searchable from within the markers panel, from within the project panel. So if you're yes. looking for the clips that are good, best, dolly, whatever whatever your, your people put in the descriptors there, you'll be able to find those clips, which makes it super easy and efficient. So um, like Jason said, if I go up here, I'm like, where's that best shot? If I type in best, it'll remove any, it'll just keep anything that has best in the descriptor. Yep. And always so remove, always make sure to hit X to get back to all the shots. That's right. so <laughs> right. I, did have, I did have someone actually ask me that. They're like, it's stuck. It's just searching on best or whatever. I said, oh, you have to hit the X to clear it. Yep. Oh, right. And that's the same thing in the program, or sorry, in the project panel. In the project when panel, yep. There, exactly. If you have something left over here, if you're like red, then you'll only have red camera shots. And you're like, where's mm -hmm. the rest of my project, man? Right. You have to X out to see you gotta everything. Gotta X it out, yeah. By so, the way, you're getting a bunch of comments here. I'll pull this one up uh, from Jared. I'm so happy that Vashi edits like me. I always throw everything into one timeline, then use markers. And yeah. uh, same it's thing from Mark. One of the best tips: all footage in one project. You know. Yeah, and this is uh, this this is a direct digital um, similar. I mean, it's an it's a digital version of an analog process. Right. where they would take all the film and string it together and put it on one reel so you could look at it on a Steenbeck or a Moviola. And here's a couple of things of why it's so effective. You, you, if you're watching this and you're like, well, what big deal? You put some stuff in a timeline, drop some markers. Um, between the, the bouncing between the first marker so you can see a different shot, it's great. But here's the thing. This, uh, this shot has four shots in it. If the director says, I want to see um, 
the sucks series and I want to see the third shot in that series. Right. I can go right over here and then hit the down arrow one, two, three, and I'm at that shot. Right. So I know that the marker gets me to the first shot in the series and the down arrow will get me to the number takes. And I can navigate without even thinking. And then the director's like, and I play it. Could you imagine you were trying to do that from a bin over oh, here? If you it open, be, if you open this here, he's like, show me the third take in the fourth setup. You're like, hold on. And, and I've had this happen. I've done this before where you're like, uh, no, hold on. No. Hey, hold right, on. Just no. Through them all. Vashi, the I'm going to let you drive go. for one quick second. I will be right back. Okay, of course. So keep on rolling. I will keep on rolling. Thank you. Um, so that's one reason this is super important in terms of sitting here and having the, the markers to denote the first take of, of a new setup and then the down arrow to get you to between the shots. Um, and then obviously having the markers open so that I can cross-reference that. Um, and I always have to click on the sequence to get the this because you can I can click somewhere else, but whatever. So this way um, I can see all my footage. And here's one other critical part. I think as an editor, I'm visually stimulated. And when I watch something, I remember like kind of the positioning of, of where it was. Um, and in a timeline, I know this was shot during one day and it's chronological. So if I go back to the start, I know that at the start of the day, this was the first shot and the second. And when I scroll through, it kind of leaves a little imprint in me where I'm like, okay, I remember it was Josh first and then some wolf footage and then Josh again, and then the big scene and then the you know wolf leaves. So I have a representation of like that day, it was Tuesday. And then when I come back to it, it leaves a little bit of an imprint. So I kind of have a, a basic idea of what was happening on this day and I can quickly bounce through it. So I use this the timeline, everything in the timeline to stimulate myself, to help me remember. Um, the memory of an editor is so critical when you're interacting with all the other teams and the directors. And directors will always say this, or producers as well. They'll say, let's say this is day five. Day five, there's a shot we need. It was somewhere at the end of the day. Well, I go to my timeline and I go somewhere at the end of the day. So I just scroll down here. And if they're in the room, they're like, um, that's the shot, the shot, the side shot of the wolf. That's what we wanted. If they said, I want something at the end of the day and you're in a bin, you literally have no idea. You're like, it could be down there and it could be, the, the clips could be alphabetical or they could be numerated with the red numbers and they don't add up. But in a timeline like this, I have temporal, a temporal layout, meaning, you know, start of the day, end of the day. I have my markers to denote each new setup and I have my up and down arrows to get me to the next shot. Um, and at a professional level, an editor should be able to find a shot very, very quickly. I supplement this with a big board on my wall where I have um, every scene that we shot and what, um, sorry, every day that we shot and what scenes were shot on that day. So if it's a 20 day shoot, I'll have a graph that has 20 days. And in each little box, it says scene six, seven and eight, scene 13. So I can see which date was shot and I can go because each one of these string outs that I have in my timeline, I'll call this, I just said six below raw, but I would call this day five. Right. So I know everything is day five on this. And on my board, it says day five and it says scenes seven, 12 and 19. So mm -hmm. I can cross reference on the chart versus a day and try and track down a shot. We only had 120 hours of footage which is not a tremendous amount compared to Deadpool, you know, 550 hours. But wow. if you're asked to find one shot in 120 hours and you don't have a system to organize it and, and yeah. track it down, then you're Come screwed. Up. Yeah, so you're really screwed. You know, that, you know, when you're dealing with bulk footage. Oh, yeah. Hey, and, so um, well, actually, ask, someone, ask this. Does, yeah. does anyone know the max length of a timeline in Premiere Pro? Right now I'm at an hour and a half. All right, I, you just heard you just I, heard the question, chats. What is the maximum timeline length in Premiere? And while and while you're chiming in, uh, Adam just asked, and I'm, I actually I was going to get into this because I don't I don't use them too much these days. Every now and again, do you ever use subclips? Um, I I have in the past, but I don't right, like making another iteration. Like you know, if I'm in here, what I like to do is, and I'm about to show. My, my system, but I don't feel I need to make subclips because it creates another pointer, like an at, not an asset. It's, it's a piece of a clip that now right. lives somewhere else. 
I right. prefer to stay in my timeline because if I need a sub clip, I can make it. But I, when I like to see visually where everything is, um, right. and I'll just drag stuff to another timeline, you know, as if it's a sub clip. But right. I don't make sub clips per se that often. I know a lot of Avid editors do. And when I train them on Premiere, they're like, I want to make a sub clip. And then they throw it at the end of their timeline and they'll just have it floating there, you know, or they'll load it yeah. in the source. But I'm like, right. you know, I don't need to. So I, uh, I just want you to know, and I'm not saying this to be nice or kind or to butter you up, but actually um, you're the one who kind of turned me on to just throwing it in the timeline, even if you're placing it two hours down in the timeline in lieu of sub clipping. Yep. So just drag this it is something that I learned from you. Yeah. <laughs> I learned it by watching you. There you um, go. In combination with your fantastic pancake timeline, uh, which is what I'm gonna just, which I, if you'd like, I'd like to talk about that now, only yes. because I've seen it presented wrong so many times, and mm -hmm. I'd like to set the record straight with everyone, like the right way to do it. Like, and to be honest, I gave it the name, you know. So the pancake timeline, is something I came up with nine years ago. The actual process I had seen before. Um, David Fincher's editors. Kirk Baxter and Angus Wall were using this on the social network. They were using this. It worked in Final Cut 7 as well, and I used it there. And it works in Premiere, but it doesn't work in Avid or, or you know anything else. So it's very limited. There's only one software. I mean, I think there's another one does now, but either way, they're from right. our lead. Um, so the, the whole point of the Pancake Timeline is obviously to gain access to footage and be able to interact with two timelines. What most people do is if I have the raw raw timeline up top and then i'm going to be cutting into six below wolf i'll drag the actual grab the name of the uh sequence drag it underneath so it turns purple and you have two stacked timelines now that's great and all and i can grab a shot and drag it down underneath um, it's non-destructive in terms of it doesn't take it if i take it from here and drop it down here it's still in the top one so it just makes a copy of that clip you go one to one so it's here but it's also here now, the problem is when I first started doing this, I'm like, well, I don't need the whole clip. I just need the in and out of this wolf, right? When I did that and you try and drag, the whole clip still goes. Right. So my solution was, all right, well, then I will edit, copy. I'll copy this little in and out and then go down here and paste it. And that's like seven clicks, right? You're like, I wish there was an easier way to do that. And there obviously is. So let me get rid of that. Um, let me do that. So this is great if you just have a whole bunch of footage and you want to like pull selects or something. Um, I'll grab this and say, well, I'm going to use this shot for sure. And then you can trim them in your other sequence. But there is a finer way to do that. Um, one other thing about this process here is if you're in your sequences and there's a shot that, that you love, that you want to make stand out, I. I've seen it grabbed and moved up one layer. So visually, you're like, that's a great shot. We're gonna, let's make sure to use that. Anyone else who sits down at this station will be able to see that it's been raised one layer and that's right. considered like a circle take or a select or, or whatever. So that's one thing I've seen um, in lots of edit bays that I've worked with and, and I've trained hundreds and hundreds of editors and anyone who does a string out will always, um, more often than not, they'll raise a clip to the next level to make it stand out. So it's an obvious choice. Now I love that. I love I love just that that concept right there because that's something I think which I even get lost myself sometimes. Again, yeah. I, I do pancaking because of you, but I sometimes forget to kind of do the raise thing. It's yeah. just an indicator of oh, this is a this is the best of maybe these three takes or something like that. just to set it apart. It just it really makes a lot of sense. Right. By the way, we've got easily a hundred people chiming in on the maximum timeline time, so. Everything from nine ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine hours, <laughs> uh, one day, ten hours, sixty. Yeah, hours, the answer is twenty four hours. That's right. Twenty four hours. Okay. I did it one day. I was cutting. Uh, I was cutting Mobius for. Um, oh yeah. Back in like twenty fourteen, I think it was the 20, premiere. Yeah, 20, of the so, so for Vincent Lafrey, I edited that short film, uh, like the first film on the C three hundred, which yep. goes back that's six years ago. Is that hard to believe? I know, something right? Something like that. Um, and I just, we had a whole bunch of footage. I'm like, well, how much can I put in here? I just kept like copying media in one timeline. So I got to 24 hours. And so that's a fair, fairly long sequence to say. Oh, that. yeah. 
I, I, I'm amazed. By the way, of course, our our, uh, our very own uh, Paco Siller on the Adobe Live team got it, but there were many other people who yeah. guessed 24. So, and a couple of people made nods to Kiefer Sutherland. So, there you go. Nicely done. <laughs> yes. Yep. Get the reference there. Exactly. <laughs> Little Jack Bauer uh, reference. And that's, gosh, that shows a long time ago already. That's, that's yeah. going way back. All right. So, so the proper pancake timeline. So I've showed you how you can make these, you know, adjustments and you're cutting, but you're cutting from one to the other. You have to drag and or copy paste, which is really not that efficient. What I want to do is go back to my project. Where's my project? And the goal is to get the sequence that I has the raw footage and let's find it in my project. I had to create this and I'm slightly disorganized and I, I feel shame. Um, there it is. So I'm going to close the raw and I will close full self right now. So what you want to do is this sequence has all my raw footage. So I can either drag it to the source monitor or I can right click and choose open, open in source monitor, right? So the first step is this sequence that has all my raw footage is now open in the source monitor. So that's great, and it's all playing in the left side, and I can hit in, out, and then hit insert, and it'll drop it in. But I wanna see all those edits. I wanna see all those cuts that, that live within there. So if you go to the wrench and you, is it a wrench? Where is it? Jason. Um, I'm losing my mind. I haven't, I haven't talked for. Bear with Are me. Are you looking for the for the gang control? No, 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 I'm looking for open in um, open in timeline. Open in timeline. Oh, I mean, I think it's in the wrench, but it's also in the right click from the from the project panel too. I think I'm just my eyeballs are like just not working. Yeah, I see open sequence and timeline there. Where is it? It's the second. You mean oh, the second option on the list? Jesus. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. So open sequence and timeline. Now, one thing you'll notice right away, which is different, is there's a red line on this playhead, which means that I'm looking at the source monitor and it shows it right here in the name source monitor. The great part is this entire timeline of raw footage is now playing in my source monitor and the timeline underneath is playing in my output monitor, right? So I now have, <laughs> you saw that, right? <laughs> you're dying to see that. So yeah. I now have the left side of my screen is my raw footage that I'm gonna work with. And the right side of my screen is the final image. So previously, everything was shown in the program monitor, which kind of gets confusing. Now, and I'm going to turn this on my uh, show, transport, show transport control so I can just use in and out. So now if I'm working and I just want to cut in, and I'll zoom in, I just want to cut in just two seconds of Josh walking. I can do in, out, and when I hit insert, it'll put it down below into my timeline. So it's literally in, out, and one button, and I've taken a chunk of this massive footage, dropped it down here. Um, there's another selection that we want to make. Let me turn this off. If you want to either nest it or use the, the full footage, delete that. We have to turn off um, this button here, which is yeah. insert or overwrite sequences, nest or individual clips. If I had three layers of audio and I want access to all three, I want that off, so when I do the same thing, in, out, and I hit insert, I will have all the audio goes with it. If I have this turned on, it'll just be one video and one audio file, which you can open and access the audio, but I prefer to see all the raw material and footage. So as you can see here, I just zoomed in, I just hit this little chunk and one button, threw it down into the timeline below. And I can scroll back and I can now look at another part and I'm like, I want this as well. In, out, insert. And it just drops it in and I don't have to do anything else. That to me is the most elegant solution for editing between two timelines and having access to pulling just what I want. And at any point I could zoom out and I can be like, well, oh, later in the day, there's another shot I want. And I remember where that shot was because I've been scrolling through this timeline all day. Yeah. I can't do that in a bin for me. For me, it all happens in this timeline and in the timeline I'm cutting into. And this so, is, I think, the most essential thing about this, dude, and you really, you really pointed this out so beautifully, is that 
So again, part of the, the beauty of having all of that content laid out, strung out in the source like that is you're, you're actively working side by side with two completely independent uh, uh, playheads yes. that really allow you to very, very efficiently, especially like as you've used markers, as you've raised yeah. videos to different tracks, to find exactly, I mean, it's just in terms of organization and speed, once you start doing this, I can't even tell you, I, I, again, I think open source and timeline is probably yeah. in, a, in a pancake way, it's probably something that most people don't realize they're used to, maybe that maybe they've pancaked, but they've got two timelines that are both playing out in the program monitor. It gets really difficult to, to, to edit that way. Sure. It's open source and timeline. That's that's really the the, the other ingredient to and that. Jason, so if powerful. you don't know, it's under the wrench and it's a section second option <laughs> down, just in case for you following at home, that's where it lives. Just so you know. <laughs> right. Yes. And just to show you, uh, here's another here's another expansive term. So, like as you can see, Jason made the great point. I lay out my stuff in one timeline. I add the markers. I can go anywhere. I raise the shots and then I open in time, open source and timeline to get the red playhead so I know it's playing on the left side. If I have, the other thing I do is I will stack different timelines here in this top. So this is my raw footage. I could have another timeline that has B-roll or another timeline that has just audio effects. I have all my hits and risers and I can see the waveforms. I can then start dragging and just dropping and filling it out because I see them all. I'm a visually based editor. I love looking at waveforms. I can tell you what a waveform is by the shape and the and the height and the power of it, right? Jason, you you know that. You oh, yeah. That forever. <laughs> Nerd alert, but yes, Nerd. I know. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm cutting audio, I can look at words and be like, there's an S, there's a T. Totally. So, yep. So that's a very important skill. And that's just, by the way, just on that, that's something which anyone can do. It just it just takes time. You know, edit enough audio discreetly, and you'll start to you'll start to see what words look like, especially if you go into spectral, yep. what certain consonants look like. You'll always be able to identify like hard attack transients, and it it's it's amazing how much faster you'll start cutting audio bits together once you can really see what it is. You don't you don't, you don't even have to listen so much as just look and identify. Yeah, right. And I've been doing a lot of editing lately, where I'll do a radio edit first. Um, mm -hmm. If I get a script from the producers, and I can't talk about it yet, but I can shortly. I've done like these four videos um, that have been seen like over 25 million times, but I can't talk about it yet, but it will come out. I'll, I'll drop the news later. But I get the script, um, I do the voiceover for the script, and I lay it all down, and then I build pictures and sound all around it. So once I'm happy with the VO, and it has the flow, the rhythm I want, I just supplement and start stacking video and images and transitions on top. Mm -hmm. And I know that the audio part's already done. If you start yep. building like, you know, oh, I want to use this image, then you drop in a sentence and then another sentence later and the timing's all off. And you're like, well, that doesn't play well with the video. Do your audio first, lay down your audio, it's radio edit, paper cut, whatever you want to call it. Do your audio first, then supplement that with everything else. Yep. Jason, how do you, mm -hmm. do you approach it that way too? Same, absolutely the same, yep. Yeah. And and in fact, someone was just asking because I was talking recently, I was um, cutting together something of, that my my youngest offspring created during quarantine. He's making little little short films and things and um, all stuff shot on the iPhone. And it required a lot of sound design and everything. But my first task is always just to get get kind of that main dialogue track clean or clean enough to the point where like it's that's all I need. I know a lot of people love cutting everything with music and all this stuff. No. but. Cut yeah, dry. I, you gotta, I cut dry. I, I'm the same. I cut. I cut dry. That's and again, I think that's. I saw there are actually quite a few comments in here. Someone was just saying, like, aren't you? When are you? Are you sick of not cutting with music? It's like, I think for some things maybe that's that's as required. But I'm like you. I like to cut it dry, and it it it, it gets added in later. But I want I want to focus on dialogue and get that story out there and just kind of string out the order of things and I'm using, I'm using sure. the audio. I agree completely. That. If your voiceover or your story or your narrative or your speech or whatever you're doing, if it's working dry without music, it's only going to be enhanced right. by the right exactly. music track. If you start exactly. throwing in, um, you know, whatever music, something popular, like, you know, anything that you put in and you start laying something down and doing VO, it's going to sound pretty good. It's a professional right. problem, Oscar winning, right. you know, soundtrack. You can right. fart over that; it's going to play great. So don't worry. Like, do it dry because you don't fool yourself. The music is 
is a slippery seductress that can get you into um, in an area where you think it's better than it is. Right. So for me, if it's yeah. working dry, then it's only going to be benefit with the right music track. You Wait. just you just kind of nailed it there, and that's the thing with with some great commercial music track. Yeah, it can bring anything alive. It can make the crappiest dialogue seem awesome um, when it isn't. And sometimes you kind of need to you need to be able to <laughs> you to be able to see that early on. Like, okay, we're missing something here. Or the, the delivery wasn't right, or we're you know it's just not going to work because oftentimes I've heard this from other editors too. They'll put in some amazing temp track, you know, they'll use Queen or Beatles or whatever, you know, it's never yeah. meant, they're not licensing that, but just to kind of get the feel. And then the task is, okay, now find something either that we can afford to license commercially or recreate that has that same spirit. And a lot of times you just can't, you can't, you know, if you, if you want, we will rock you. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of hard to find anything comparable. That's like that. And that they'll has jump that, on you. Yeah, you know, right. They will jump right. on you and show right. you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Though that's the, the, the key point is audio. We'll do we'll do that tomorrow with some more specific examples. Again, I'm not trying to bombard everyone with too much. Like I want to show the most important things that work for me, and I hope that we're entertaining and informative at the same time. So I appreciate everyone for spending time. I know two hours is a long time, and um, it's I'm, I'm enjoying this tremendously. Um, oh yeah. Last thing about the, the pancake timeline was, um, like I said, just the fact that it's on the. The source monitor has my raw footage and the other monitor has my stuff. So I have two screens going on one on one screen, like two windows on one screen. It's amazing. If I go to any other timeline, everything's playing on the right side only, right? Because they're both output. So I can still cut to it, but I so prefer having, and it has to say source monitor next to your timeline if you use that open, in, um, open timeline and source or open source and timeline. I just find it amazing to just to hold on one image. And then I scroll through, I'm like, where am I gonna drop this? Where, where's it gonna perfectly work? And I can just scroll through until I find that point, you know? Cause this is like triggering me to respond to this other visual. So that's my, the benefit and that's the secret looking to the proper way to use the pancake timeline. Now, if you use it just to drag stuff from one to the other, that's fine. This will give you um, the intricate chance and this is, this is why I don't have to do sub clips because I can literally just go, I just want that. I want the camera crew looking over here and I want that. And then I literally just hit insert and it drops it underneath and I'm good to go. So to me, that's just spectacular access. And when you have 10 hours of footage in a timeline, as long as you have markers and you go over on the right side to your markers panel, everything is labeled or you can visually see the first, first frame of a new setup. It's so easy to navigate. Um, that's why I'm not, I'm not daunted by hundreds of hours of footage because I take the time up front to organize and create this system. And it, this has taken me 10 years to get to this point where right. it's hitting on all cylinders between the pancake timeline, the markers, the marker panel, my little up raised shots, they all go mm -hmm. hand in hand. And, and if one of those isn't there, then it, not that it falls apart, but it's not as efficient. Right. So when someone says I got 20 hours of footage and they're like bragging, I'm like, Sweet, we'll just throw that in one timeline. Right. <laughs> and they were looking at you like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> as long as I have the time to organize it, then I'm never daunted by amount of footage. It's just, it's how you manage it. It's how you contain it and make it your own and, and just bend it to your will. Totally. We are getting a lot of love from all of this. Oh, Bashi, that's, it's coming, that's awesome. Coming in droves. No, I'm, I'm glad. Of, yeah. Throwing them up here. This is badass. Two hours is not, it's not easy. This is hard, but I'm really enjoying it. It's fun. All right. So now I, this is something we're going to cover, I, I imagine, tomorrow. Um, and just and just for housekeeping purposes. Yeah. So we have about 22 more minutes. Um, but since this, it just got asked twice on two different chats. So just real quickly about, about cutting audio. And a couple of people have mentioned, too, like also another really good point. Really good idea to sort of cut on smaller you know, not crappy speakers, but yet like don't necessarily go for like huge, you know, massive stereo uh, 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 theater style speakers when cutting. It's kind of a, first of all, it's just a good practice to have multiple speakers if that's possible. Yeah. But I fully agree that having something that's kind of more, you know, we used to refer to them like the, um, like boombox speaker, right? If you could mix yeah. something on a bo you know, to a boombox speaker or a mono yeah. speaker, like an old Tivoli or something, and yeah. if it sounded good there, 
like in the classic Yamaha NS10M days, then it would sound good everywhere. And this is this is no different in 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 video too, right? I mean, you you know, if if, if you mix for the big theater, oh. you 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 might have diminishing returns when you listen on earbuds or you know on a television sure. or whatever. I, I usually mix on mix. I'll mix in my studio and I have subwoofers and stuff, but mm -hmm. I've gotten to the point where I know what will sound good on another device. And I'm, I'm right. not learning my deliverables if it's for YouTube or whatever, the web-based. I know it's going to be mostly like iTunes. Sorry, it's going to be like an iPhone or iPad or it's a laptop. And right. so I do mix differently in terms of sure. my voice. If I have a voiceover or whatever, it's usually too pronounced because there's no bass in those smaller right. devices that, that bring in the bottom and flesh it out. So I'll back off on the voice a little bit and know that it'll still balance out well. It may not sound mm -hmm. as good in my perfect studio speaker setup, but I know the end deliverable will get a really cool version of that. And, so and that's key. That. That, that's key too, especially for like internet, web and mobile delivery. It's, it, it's a different consideration. I mean, yes, you can have kind of the, it's going to sound good everywhere, but um, if you know that your main... Um, consumption mechanism is going to be a phone or an iPad or earbuds. I mean, it, it behooves you to mix differently and really to mix to those mediums. And again, like I, I, it's funny, you just made me think it's not this Dell series you're using, but it's one of the recent ones. I remember seeing a commercial that they're touting that, you know, the speakers on the laptop now has 300% more bass, which Where's is, is right. Yeah. I mean, it's just funny that by the way, that's not slamming Dell or anybody. No. I mean, a laptop speaker, you know, laptops now are, you know, they're this thin. You don't, you just don't have enough. There's just not oh, enough physical not, thing. No, you well, they, they, you can't move. No, you can't push air yeah. enough. It's yeah. never going to, it's so 300%. Someone said to me, well, do you think then that that's, that's inaccurate? That's a lie. I said, no, no, no. I'm it sure is, it's 300% more from what was previously nothing. Which was nothing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the first I mean, you can even... Just to nerd out, I remember I did this on one of the, with the MacBook Pros with a, with a pair of uh, matched pair condensers from the laptop speakers at like 50% volume, properly gain say, just to see how much bass response was actually coming through. This is a couple of years ago. I mean, and you know, not surprisingly, there, there was nothing, nothing below 500 hertz, nothing, nothing. The, the bass that you're feeling is oh, when it's on the it? table and it's vibrating, right? I'm still here if everyone can hear me. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're there. Did okay, we... sorry, you cut out. Maybe it was Oh, weird. okay. Oh, weird. Yeah, that must be it. Uh, yeah, no, I was saying I did this crazy test, and there was nothing uh, below 500 hertz. Right. And in fact, what bass response you're, you know, perceiving is when the laptop is on a table, yeah. right? So and it's causing the surface. vibration, right? And so you're feeling this low-end warmth of the vibration of the overall program material, but coming out of the little speakers. Right. You'd have to take that table with you everywhere you go if you wanted that bass <laughs> right. response, which could get cumbersome. Super, super amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um, while we take it, while we're getting closer, I just wanted to finally, I'm teasing everyone, screw it. I shot a film with uh, Jason um, a couple of years back and you guys deserve to see this. Like, look at this beautiful man. Look, look at that. How could you say no to a man like that? Look at that oh, hair flow. Wow. <laughs> this is oh. where uh, you convinced me. You could tell this a while ago because my hair still had color in it. This is where you you convinced me to have um, uh, fans in my rider when I do any kind of shoot from now on. Have to have fans on set. And, I, and I, don't mean, I don't mean fans as in like they like me. Actual physical devices that blow air to... <laughs> And look, and I'm I actually the working effect. man. So, oh yeah, taking notes. Look at him. Look at this man. What a beautiful man. Oh my goodness. But one of the best experiences ever. And we we did it all. I believe the take we used was take one. Was it? Yeah. Not? Turn up. And you're just you just kill it right out of the gate. So yeah. <laughs> making just take so many different uh, twists and turns. I love it. Oh, dude, that was one of the greatest experiences ever. It really was. And it's, yeah. and it's again, it's a testament to you and your style and trust. You know, this is something which we didn't really touch upon too much. <clears throat> Maybe we can talk more about it tomorrow. But um, thinking about <clears throat> having you in the field for Six Below and your crew kind of, again, in these like, in a scenario where there's there's no connectivity, you're, you're, a, yeah. you're really 
uh, a victim to the elements around you. I mean, anything could have happened. And there has to be a certain amount of trust between like actor, director, producer, cinematographer that just makes those things flow. And I remember that session with us specifically, we, we had we had a few talks in advance. We hadn't personally met yet. We'd met over the phone and via right. email, but <clears throat> you just trusted me. And I remember I came in, I remade the soundtrack that accompanies that. And, uh, you know, I remember sending that to you first and you're like, okay, yeah, you just, you roll with it, you know, yeah. uh, and that was it. And you just had this trust in me that made it so easy and effortless. And that, that just speaks to your, like, you know, you're just awesomeness as a human, but also as like a director, you, you get the people you're working with and you, you instill this feeling of like, okay, we're, we're here. To, it's one goal. Let's do something awesome. You know, you're listening, but your brain's working too. And that that's what made that so great. No, I mean, that was no, truly no, one of my best, and best life experiences shooting that with you. That was a super blast. I hope we get to do that again. And to your point, um, I think this goes over. Um, I was a professional hockey player for 10 years. My father was in the NHL. He just was voted into the, into the Hockey Hall of Fame last year. And I think there's a direct correlation between a sports team and like a post or a filmmaking team in terms of um, everyone should be committed. Everyone's pulling on the same rope. You have to trust one another. You have to have each other's back. And most importantly, you have to know your role and be the best at your job. You're there for a reason. In post-production, the editor, I'm there to tell the story given all the pieces and parts. Um, on a hockey team, the fighter is there to protect other players and let them be able to be creative and give them a sense of security. You know, the director is there to guide the team. The coach is there to get the best results. There's a lot of correlation between sports and filmmaking to be successful. Like there's a lot of really bad directors or bad editors or bad players on a team, but the successful ones, there's something clicking on all cylinders that everyone is, is trust. I think trust is the most important one because you'll go through a wall for someone if you trust them. And if they work hard, it's not about talent. Talent is one of the lowest things on the list when it comes to being successful or good at a job or at, at film editing or filmmaking or whatever. None of that. It's the people that grind, the people that you can count on, the people that you want to be around. That to me are the hallmarks of an amazing filmmaker. And you know, you know how, you know how many skilled, talented people are out there that have, no one's ever seen their work because they can't get it in front of anyone, whatever. They don't want to go the extra step, but they're super talented. And there's the grinders, the humpers that get stuff done and promote themselves. And, and it'll resonate. If you have something good, good things will happen. And well, and you, you, you said it there too. It's It's got to be people that you want to be around. Totally. You know, that that affects the whole thing from, from input, from ingest to output. I mean, yeah. if you don't like being around, you know, the star of your show, <laughs> that's that's going to make it really difficult. And I, I I can remember when I first had my stint in LA many moons ago. And, uh, you know, after being in the music biz and having some success, having to kind of restart over. And I remember I was working for Media Ventures, Hans Zimmer's company at the time, and talking with one of the the hiring managers there. And, and I was like, so, you know, it's pretty awesome. You know, thanks for giving me this opportunity. And they said, yeah, well, you just seemed like someone, you know, that we'd like to like hang out with, you know, hopefully you're not a jerk or you'll be out of here yeah. tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> By the way, they said those exact words to me. Hopefully you're not a jerk. Actually, I think it was an expletive, but hopefully you're not a jerk. Otherwise you'll be out of here tomorrow. Right. Um, so you got, that was order. it. They gave you right. Order. It, it wasn't it wasn't that I had done this number of albums or this number of billboard things or whatever. It was like, no, you yes, you have some knowledge, but you seem you seem cool. It seems like you're gonna oh. be able to, you know, we're gonna be able to work with you and you're gonna work hard and we're gonna give you a shot. And they yeah. did. Um thank you for sharing that. No, that's important. Like everyone has a story and everyone comes from somewhere and everyone not that they end up somewhere, but it's like a lot of it's in your control and how you interact with people. And I I tell everyone when they say, How do you become an editor? And I say, be good with people. Be nice yeah. with people. Be someone you, that you want to be around. That'll get you so much further than I have the latest computer and I can cut super fast, awesome stuff. And I got the best uh, set of track music and royalty free. I don't care. Are you nice? Are you you know pleasant? Mm -hmm. So um, just to try and get this wrapped up, just so we know where we're at. We covered the first yeah. five today, which is you know hardware through advanced audio, sorry, advanced film editing, which is pancake timeline. Tomorrow we'll do audio, color correction, VFX, deliverables. So. We'll have plenty of time to fill in the blanks. If anyone wants to tell Jason some other stuff, like what you know, what they want to hear, but there'll be more than enough stuff to go over tomorrow. 
Um, one thing we're talking about since we're just finishing up on editing, I made this because when you're dealing with um, a lot of footage and, and how do you approach an edit for either a scene or a film or whatever, it's nice to break down, you know, what the actual components are. And, and for me, it's like, you know, a shot is just one thing. A moment is a couple shots that mean something. A scene is you know, several moments that equate to a bigger thing. You know, a sequence is a bunch of scenes that are trying to drive mm -hmm. towards a point. A reel is roughly 20 to 22 minutes of a film because that's what film used to be delivered on to the theaters. Right. So the right. reel is, again, analog to digital. There's the convergence. So reel is about 22 minutes and film is, you know, the blood, sweat and tears of the entire team, crew, everyone. And so sometimes it's nice to look at it in components as opposed to a uh, film is so daunting that it's just so many things. Well, there's how it breaks down. I love that. And this is something which if, if everyone's not already screenshotted, and of course you have this on your site too. I'll have, yeah, I'll have it on my site and I'm going to... Um, yeah, I'll and you can, I, and I've been posting it in the chats, by the way, we'll, we'll pull it up at the end again as well, but okay. I've been posting your link multiple times here. But I love this because it, one, for one thing, it's not all, terminology is, is, is important, right? I mean, yeah. we can't, we can't neglect the legacy of, of filmmaking. Yes, it's not what it was even 10 years ago, let alone 50 years ago or oh, anywhere yeah. in between 100 years ago. Um, but these terms, they they still apply. You know, like someone was asking me something on a recent stream about, we were talking about expressions, actually, how I'm not, I, I don't like to use colloquialisms and things in my speech, especially because we have such international audiences. Right. But I said something about in film and in, in acting, you know, taking a beat and someone asked me about that and was asking like oh do you mean like <laughs> like give me a beat and i was like no 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 not yeah. that and we kind of went into the origins of this a little bit and it's it's just one of those things that you're you're going to hear this a lot so whether whether you really use real or not per se yeah like you were saying before it's it's something in your toolbox you know if you're nice it doesn't really matter if you know what real is or was or right. meant but <clears throat> it behooves you to have those little those little gems of knowledge because it does, it just kind of up levels your craft and it shows that you're really dedicated and interested in, in the process. You know, I, I give way too many anecdotal, bizarre old school stories on here during our live streams all the time, which are fortunately well received, but it's, I think it's because you start to, we start to lose a little bit of that because of how quickly things get kind of thrown out and put together now, but all of this still matters, right? Especially yeah. if you're putting something longer form, you're going to encounter these terms and it just, it, it helps to really know what they are and the origin. And it's, it's just going to make you a, a better editor, right? Totally. In the end. Yeah. One other thing I, I made a, a shareable about it is that people always ask me, like when you start editing a film, uh, do you know, how, how do you start? Like you start the beginning. Uh, my advice is always to, if you have all the footage and you're in that lucky position and you've already read the script, approach a scene that you, that you feel really a connection to it could be the first scene. It could be in the middle of the film. It could be the climax. But I always find if I gravitate gravitate towards a scene that I really understand and I've seen the footage, I'm like, oh my god, I know how to cut this. I know it. That's what I cut first. No one says you have to start cutting at the beginning of the film. Nope. Latch on to something that grab that you gravitate to, and that you have an emotional connection to because you know it's going to be cut better. Then when you show that to the director and, or the producers you'll gain their trust because they're like, oh, he gets it or, or she gets it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. they, they we're on the same page and it's not showing off. It's just, it's, it's just saying that I get it. I know what we're going for. I understand the tone. I've already had those conversations. Here's my take on this moment. And that, get, that gets you a lot of, uh, not leeway, but it gets you a lot of trust. You're gaining trust by saying, look, I know what you guys want. I know what this thing needs. Here it is. Yep. So that's why I, I like to say, like, pick pick that scene. Don't always start at the beginning. Nice. Hey, by the way, so we've got a question pulled up uh, from TV, TV Design. Can one have several pancake sources that are switching when you switch the timelines? Yeah, you can add you can add another source in here, and this will be a source, and then this will be a source, and you can do like three or four up here, and then have. Right. I think I've seen there. you do even three or four, but that's the key is they're all being fed. For, so it's one program yes. monitor timeline, but multiple yes. sources. Multiple sources, correct. Yeah. You can do that. So that's why I said uh, I'll have like raw footage and then I'll have B-roll on this one or sound effects or visual effects. And then again, it's all just laid out there and I can just do in, out and drop it down wherever my playhead is. So that's definitely for sure. I mean, I've done, I've, I've screwed, around, screwed around where I've done like um, 
Where is this? Hmm? It's not that you drag this, is it? Where you can do you know, three timelines. I've had like five timelines just for just to, to see what I could do. But um, you know, that's but with the tabs, I don't need to do it vertically, I can do it horizontally and maintain just the one and two, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I just do two, you know, and I have my tabs. Um how about one last thing before we have um if yeah, we've got about questions. Four, six more minutes. And we're, yeah, I'm just taking questions. By the way, I just see right here, someone someone is familiar, Amy and Carl McKay, Big Ned. There he is. Oh, I love them so much. They're so beautiful. And I owe them a call. I'm saying this publicly, Carl. I owe you such a call. I have you buried. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. I love you both. Be nice to me. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I feel bad. Um, no, they're sweet. He's an amazing editor himself, and he inspired me. We used to go to these hockey tournaments and he was he was uh, tasked with taking hundreds of hours of footage from like four day weekend and cutting it down into a basically a showreel for all the guys. Mm -hmm. And Carl was is a hockey player as well. And he would he had to shoot everything and party and play hockey. That's oh, very wow. difficult to do all those That's things. Not easy. And yeah. get the angle, <laughs> right? um, with the time we have left, I just wanted to share this. This is again. Um, take a screenshot or whatever. Like, you know, this is from like 20 years of dealing with stuff. I'm not going to walk through. If someone has a question about one specifically, I can answer it. I'm but make this full screen. Yeah. Yeah. But I just think it's important. There's, there's a lot of things to learn. I just try to break it down into, again, digestible chunks for, for everyone. And um, I think one of the most important things in our industry and in every industry is like pride in your work and, like obviously giving your hundred percent all the time, but sometimes it's 150% that you have to give. Like I was on a deadline last night. I was up to like four 30 to hit it and then wake up to prep for this. And um, it's not easy sometimes, but it is so rewarding later when you get the feedback that you want, um, especially when the work you've created and collaborated with has a, an effect, you know, makes a difference. It resonates with people. That's the ultimate, um, Thing that I enjoy. I'm not in it for fame, money, yes. Um, but I want to leave a mark. I want to leave a message. I want to create something that has a chance to, to grow and will hit other people emotionally the same way. Like that's what makes me feel good, you know? So, uh, you know, um, and this is actually really a kind of a great, a great place to kind of end today. And I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, as I'm reading through these, I, I like that so much of this is actually, it's actually about, it's, it's, People. The lessons are actually very specific to like behavior, right? Yeah. It's it's human behavior. There's there's very little in here. I there's nothing in here that's like know your s. There's no technical right. technical right. Technical is technical so here at all. List of right. editorial or post production. Technical is a is a good thing to know like the basics, but it's not going to get you. You know, it's not going to get you the work. Yeah. It's just not. And maybe you could elaborate a little on this. I'd love your take on this because this is something which, uh, fortunately, I uh, we've discussed this. You know, I was really fortunate to have a lot of mentors when I was starting out in in, in the music biz in particular. And um, this concept of knowing your role, but embracing and owning your role. And maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit of that because I think this is something which I think people, especially now, it, it, it's 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 hard to. I think there's there's like a, a fear of owning it, and there's also this question of like, do I need to, do I need to do a little bit of your job and a little bit of your job, and because I'm, it's going to make me look better, which kind of goes against that. It goes against like, the team like, philosophy. Yeah. Like, right? You're you're talking, you're you're nailing it exactly. Know your own, own your role. Like, be the best at your job. No one's going to take that from you. If you have extra left over, um, that doesn't mean you go somewhere else and be like, hey, I finished my stuff. Can I, let me take a look at yours. I'll give you some feedback. No one wants your feedback. At that point, all right. So, like, know your role, be the best at your role, and own your role. You will get more respect when you um, over deliver something in your spectrum of what you're doing and what you're hired on that job for than anything else. So, slay it, do that, and you know what? As soon as you're done with that task, don't wait and for someone to say, "All right, you want to move on to the next day's footage, or whatever." Just do it. Start doing it. When someone comes in, they see you cutting like tomorrow's footage. You're like, what are you doing? Oh, I already finished that. I'm just moving forward, just trying to get ahead of it, try and stay ahead of it. So like know your role and then, but own your role, be the best X or whatever it is that you are and just own it and have pride in that you didn't cut any corners, that you triple checked your work, 
that you don't deliver something and be like, oh, hold on, no, no, don't look at that version. I got another version. I caught something. I yeah. screwed up. Right. Oh, I didn't. I didn't watch the export that I yeah, just I didn't spent. watch the export. Oh my god! Just right? handle your business. Like be the best. Where if you have the trust of the director, the producers, the other teammates, that's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. To have their trust that you don't drop the ball, that you just deliver. You're the mailman. You know, like I, that's the best feeling. I love so, that, and I really, again, just that concept of like it, and it doesn't matter what the role is either, no. right? I mean, I'm I'm Here. the person. That, Right. Supervisor, boom, right. operator, whatever. Just right. be the best. Like just be, own it. Be awesome. Be yeah. grateful. Right. Yeah. You know, um, that stuff goes a real long way. And uh, yeah, Paco is saying slay it. Yes. I mean, that's it. You know, my, my uh, again, one of these mentors used to tell me, don't, don't go to a, a shoot or a session and have anyone in that room be able to say, oh, you know, he, he just like didn't do his job or he was lazy or he was just like, was this yeah. dude even here? Like what, right. what was he here for? You want them to be saying, hey, maybe, do you want to hear this? Do you want to take a look at this cut? Hey, Vashi, maybe you're the boom operator in those days. You want to see the cut that we just did? Like yeah. you want those invitations and those are only going to come by being a decent human, right? Totally. We want to share. Yeah, we want to share. Um, mm -hmm. Just, I put up on my screen, that's the link. The bit.ly link is to my, the 69 page PDF that breaks oh, down everything. So, so some people can even get a jump on tomorrow's stuff if they want to peek at that. But that's a really good reference. And again, that's the culmination of like 20 years of, of making mistakes and then dialing it down into a coherent system of approaching uh, post-production, you know, and that's some of my social media. If you want to reach out to me, if that helps. Like, yes, indeed. That's All right, friends. Well, with that, we are just about out of time. So thank you so much for joining. We'll be back tomorrow. tomorrow. Same time, same channels. Uh, 12 Pacific here on Adobe Live, Behance. So be sure to stick around for what's up next. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Vashi, stay on because I'll be joining you in a second. Okay. But until then, everyone, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you next time. Thank Take you, everyone. Care. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.